Okay, so um, as I said, you're really welcome to this um, seminar on the um, global citizenship, food and biodiversity theme. Um, so I know you're, you're all possibly real experts on this. Um, I'm not sure how long you've been coordinators, but um, your schools have been um, working on the Green Schools program for a long time. So apologies if this is all old hat to you, I'll just fly through it. Um, so Green Schools um, is part of the Environmental Education Unit of Antarctica. Um, so it's one of many different programs. Some of them you might have been involved with um, over the course of your work. Um, so things like National Spring Clean, you're probably familiar with Blue Flag, Clean Coast, etc. Um, and the Green Schools program itself, it's an international program. It's run in countries all around the world. Um, it's generally known as Eco Schools outside of Ireland, but it's the same um, premise, the same seven step process. Um, and, you know, it's hopefully a long term program that, um, that takes in um, whole school actions. And in Ireland, um, it's run in schools um, all around the country, just under 90 percent um, of primary and secondary schools um, are registered to participate. Um, everyone's at different stages on the program. Um, we actually have quite a lot of schools who are just starting the first theme of litter and waste this year, which is is great to have new schools on board. Um, and then we obviously have other schools like yourselves who are on our 10th theme. Um, but taken together, it's a huge number um, of students and teachers who are who are working away. And um, when we look at the effects that um, schools on this theme have, it's, it's really impactful. I'll show you a few stats uh, in a minute. Um, and talking about how impactful you all are, I just want to let you know um, about an opportunity to um, look into. So um, I mentioned that Green Schools is an international program and it's coordinated internationally by um, an organization called FEE. They're the Foundation for Environmental Education um, and they have um, the Global Teacher Award. Um, it's open for applications now. And I know we're, we're not great about putting ourselves forward in Ireland, but um, there is brilliant work being done in schools um, and the opportunity is there to, to nominate a teacher in your school or yourself um, for this um, award um, because the, you know, the work you're doing is brilliant. Um, and there was actually an Irish winner in the last couple of years. Um, so Ireland is often seen as a, a really good case study for the, the Green Schools or the Eco Schools programme. Um, so it's uh, it's something worth thinking about. Um, and on that kind of global theme, um, this year and also next year, 2024, Antashka is really pleased to be nominated as an SDG champion. So you, you're probably familiar with the um, Sustainable Development Goals. Um, these are a set of goals that were um, agreed upon by leaders at the UN back in 2015. Um, and the, the goals aim to you know, um, fight poverty and inequality, climate change, etc., um, and to promote and advocate for these goals, um, several organizations have been nominated as SDG champions, and um, we're one of them. Um, and a lot of this is due to the the work being done by schools, and the the food and biodiversity theme in particular links well with quite a lot of the goals. Um, I picked out goal two, zero hunger there as one of them, but it also links with, you know, life on land, uh, with responsible production, with health and well-being. So it's just to show that, you know, what, what you're doing in school is related to many of the things that are looked at as, you know, important goals worldwide. Um, and as there, it's such important work being done, we do want to make sure everyone is aware that, uh, Green Schools is for everyone to participate in. So um, we welcome people from all backgrounds, ethnicities, um, sexual orientations, religion, et cetera, et cetera. And we, we want everyone to feel um, that they have a place here and they can get involved in the program. Um, and uh, as Bernadine mentioned, um, she's the EAO for Meath. Um, there's a few different county councils represented this evening. So um, it, the, the environmental awareness officer is there to, to support your school. They, they will likely be the person carrying out your renewal visit, um, but they're also a good contact to have um, throughout your work on the theme. Um, sometimes, you know, that they are be more likely to be able to tell you about things happening locally or projects you can get involved in 
um, and just as a, another support as well. So um, I will be sharing this presentation at the end, so um, you, you'll get their contact information then. Um, and just to see where we are in the Green Schools program all the way here at um, theme 10. And uh, so this is the, the newest of the Green Schools themes and it's also the last theme. So when you do um, get your, your green flag for this theme, you won't be going on to something new. Um, we're kind of moving into more of a project-based um, work after this. Um, and the work on those projects will link back to, to one of the existing themes, but um, we felt we, we wouldn't keep going um, and adding new themes. Um, and the, the this theme obviously links back to theme five, biodiversity, um, but we've put a, a focus on um, food and the links to biodiversity there. But just to give um, a few stats um, about the impacts that schools and all the themes have, um, these are, are taken from the um, the schools which were awarded a green flag last year. Um, and the, we get a lot of information from your application forms and it, it does show um, the, the results and the, the impacts that schools can make. So for example, uh, schools on litter and waste, we had 73% of schools on this theme reduce the amount of waste going to landfill. And um, on the biodiversity theme, we had over six and a half thousand trees planted, which is amazing. Um, and you can kind of look at any of them and, and uh, see the results. Um, and just to focus in on the food and biodiversity theme. So as I said, it's a very new theme. Last year was only the second year we had um, schools being awarded with flags. Um, and 95% of schools planted potatoes. So potatoes were the most popular crop. I'm kind of surprised because they're one of the harder ones to grow. Um, but on average, schools planted um, 10 different types of crops. And with those, they attempted 41 different recipes. So it was it was great to see um, how schools got on, what they focused on. Um, and we, we really value, um, especially for this theme, um, getting information back from the application forms because it is so new and um, so any feedback is appreciated. Um, and just to uh, give a, a small bit of background before I go into the kind of nitty gritty, um, as I said, we this is kind of following on from the initial biodiversity theme, which um, you know focuses on the, the many different ways that biodiversity is important, you know, obviously providing us with uh, clean air, many of the plants storing um, lots of carbon, providing us with food, with medicines, with um, a lot of the products we use every day, um, giving us spaces for enjoyment and recreation. Um, I could go on and on. Um, but um, when when uh, your school will probably be working on biodiversity, um, the main message we were hoping to get across and the main action was you know, about the idea that, um, you know, obviously biodiversity is referring to all of the different types of living things from flowers to fish to birds to fungi and bacteria. Um, the main message on the theme was that the, the more diversity we have, the better. So the more different types of living things and um, the healthier the planet will be, the more resilient it will be. Um, and this applies to the this theme as well. Um, but we chose to focus in on, on food, on its relationship with biodiversity, um, because we felt it, it really ticked a lot of boxes. Um, so there was a lot of links with the, the other themes. Um, so if you look at, you know, litter and waste, a lot of connections between the packaging used for, for food, as well as direct food waste itself, um, connections between energy and how um, food is um, processed and stored. Um, lots of connections with water, both from the point of view of um, water required to produce food, to grow it, um, but also the, the possible effects on our, our waterways from, from growing food and uh, opportunities for runoff from agriculture that might have pesticides or fertilizers, etc. Um, lots of links with travel in terms of food miles, and obviously with, with biodiversity being the, the main focus in terms of um, you know, the positive impact that pollinators, biodiversity and soil have, um, you know, natural um, predators of pests like birds eating slugs, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and as well as those links, we also thought that there was a lot of good opportunities 
um, for students in terms of, you know, an interest in learning about um, their food that they eat, something that, you know, we all have, probably have a bit of an interest in, um, as well as the, the possible benefits um, that, you know, being outside and particularly getting, you know, hands dirty and in the soil can have on students overall, you know, health and well-being. Um, you know, we found from our, our pilot project with it that um, teachers were reporting, um, you know, positive impact on students' behavioral issues and their social skills, their capacity for teamwork, confidence building from being able to, to grow and, and harvest something themselves. Um, and it is also uh, hopefully a practical life skill that students can take with them um, beyond school. So that's just the background to the theme and um, why we are focusing on it and what we hope to come out of it. So I'm going to go through um, the, the actual um, seven steps of how to complete the program. So as with all um, Green Schools themes, the first step is to set up your committee. Um, and the committee can be formed in many different ways. Um, but the, the two essential elements are that you have students on the committee who are really involved in decision making and coming up with ideas and actions, and that there's also a, a staff member as a coordinator. Um, schools will all do um, the kind of uh, the election of students to the committee in different ways. Uh, many primary schools um, will either they might have a teachers nominate a student, they might have a lottery system so that people um, different people get a, a turn on being on the committee. Um, sometimes they'll have students, you know, write a letter or draw a picture to show why they should be selected. And um, there might be um, a vote or an election um, or, you know, in, in smaller schools, you might have any student that wants to participate, get on board. Um, some secondary schools will have a lot of TY students or students, you know, maybe not in exam years taking part. Um, and that's all fine as long as there is students. Um, leading the committee, we're, we're kind of happy with that. Um, but then you can also go and, and add additional staff members. Uh, it's really helpful for yourselves to have um, a bit of support and um, spread out the workload a bit and also just to be that extra voice in the in the staff room um, when you're, we're talking about these issues. Um, and maybe um, have a look around and see, are there any um, other people who might be interested? Like, are there any parents um, or grandparents of, of students who are involved in growing food? You know, are there any farmers? Are there anyone, you know, who has an allotment? Is there anybody working in the food industry in some way? You know, they might not be able to come and join the committee and attend all your meetings, but they might be willing to come in and, and have a chat with the committee or with the class or get involved in a particular project. Um, and another great person to, to get involved you know, if you have um, a groundskeeper or a caretaker who, who's involved with the grounds, again, they might have some expertise they can offer, but they're also a good person to just keep in the loop, um, particularly if you're going to be um, growing food outside um, so that they're aware of, of what's going on. Um, and do remember with the committee that you want to try and, and aim towards whole school involvement. So, um, you know, if you are... Um, a primary school and you don't have any infants classes or first class on the committee, making sure that, that those classes are kept updated with what's going on, what the theme is about. Um, um, or similarly, if you're a secondary school and you don't have those exam years, you know, giving opportunities for those students to be updated and, and have opportunities to get involved as well. Um, so once you have your, your committee up and running, we're on to step two. This is the environmental review whereby you're kind of seeing what is the situation like in your school now? You know, is there a lot of awareness around the connections between food and biodiversity? Um, and also what are your grounds like in terms of um, growing spaces or existing um, growing food? So th these are two, as, we as I say here, essential actions, which means you will be asked about them on your application form and in your renewal visit. So they kind of have to be documented. And then um, these are other optional actions. So these are things you could do and add to your action plan, but you won't be directly asked about them um, when you're uh, applying. 
Uh, so I'll come back to them later, but we'll go into these, these two essential actions in a bit more detail. So this is the awareness survey. Okay, so it's seven questions. Um, and uh, Anne asked about, you know, do, do you have to print it off and give it to every single person? Um, you can you definitely don't have to do that. So um, we've got um, uh, a link to the awareness survey at the end. And the, the best way to do it probably is with a hands up survey. So the way the um, the awareness survey we have laid out is that you, you might print out one per class. Um, and then the teacher will fill in. So what percentage of students and staff have grown food before? So I say you're in the class and you say, OK, hands up. How many people have grown food before? And then you, you write that in. So the the printout that um, we have online, the first question isn't asking you in percentage. It asks you what number. So it makes it easier to fill in and then you, you can convert later. And um, so that's definitely a better way of doing it. Um, some people, some schools have done it also online. If you have, you know, a, a Teams system or something that you can send it around in or a Moodle, you know, feel free to do that. Um, so, yeah, definitely want to save as much paper as we can. Um, and, yeah, I should say before I move on, don't worry too much about the results of that survey. Um, you know, we, we don't really judge um what what actual numbers of people could answer correctly. It's more just so you, you get a baseline yourselves um, of what, what knowledge is there. Um, so the second element then that is uh, essential is to create a food habitat map. So what that is, is it's some kind of visual representation of your school grounds that is gonna help you plan where you're gonna grow your food and assess what are your grounds already like now do you have any wild food growing? You know, is there blackberries growing over your walls? Um, do you have any fruit trees or hazel trees? Um, is there any areas that will help um, attract pollinators that might help your crops to grow, um, etc.? Um, and it's we also have in our um resource on this is a checklist you can do um inside the school in terms of are there any spaces that are um problems in terms of you know is there any a lot of litter coming from lunch waste um and that kind of thing so here's a nice example um of a, a map made by a school last year so they had this kind of sketch done in, in the center of the map they have a key done but then they were also adding in photographs to the sides so as they were planting crops they could add in photos of what they look like now um, they got a new bike shed halfway through, so they added a picture of that. Um, you know, you can change it up, um, add pictures in as the seasons change, etc. Um, so to to make it a bit clearer and to help you, we do have a, a good few resources on this. So there's a lesson plan um at this link here. So anything in blue you can you can click on. Um, and that has a, a, a brief presentation you can show in class, and then there's um some advice for how to carry it out, plus, plus that checklist I mentioned. We also did a webinar for teachers last year just on the habitat maps that kind of brings you through it step by step. So if you want more information on that, you can watch back the seminar here. Um, and there's also a presentation that went with it. You can you can add to that here as well. Um, so that's the review done. So hopefully, um, that's something you, you would aim to do, you know, before, say, Christmas in your first year. Um, and then you're going to start looking at your action plan. So the action plan is um, where you set out what you plan to do um, on the theme. And it might be informed by your review. So if you found that um, st students didn't know a lot about the links between food and biodiversity, maybe one of your actions would be to try to increase that knowledge in some way or in several different ways. Um, and the main aims of your, your actions will probably be either increasing awareness or increasing practical knowledge and skills. Um, and I'll go through some, some examples of that now. So in terms of increasing awareness, um, you know, the best way to do this is probably getting students outside and, 
and seeing things for themselves. So uh, as they go through the process of, of growing food, um, there's lots of, of natural learning opportunities there. Plus, like I said, a lot of benefits from, from getting their, their hands in the soil and um, raises all kinds of positive um, hormones and things um, make us feel a bit happier. Um, you can also look at creating signage, um, sharing the results of your, your survey, um, and, and just getting getting people involved and aware of what's happening. Um, the, this is a nice form of signage here. Um, this school, they used um, paint pens to um, write into different names of what they were planting and then varnished the, the stone afterwards so it didn't wash off in the rain. That's quite a nice idea. Um, and then in terms of practical improvements, you know, the main focus might be creating growing spaces. So, um, you know, we, we we don't want you to feel you have to have, you know, big raised beds um, for growing your crops. You know, it, it can be done in, in much smaller spaces. So many schools will use pots, window planters. Um, these here, these are potatoes being um, grown in grow bags. Um, you can recycle lots of old material, like there's a lot of things that can be used um, as a container. So as long as it keeps soil within it and there's some kind of drainage, you can probably grow food in it. So, um, you know, clearing out people's sheds can be a good opportunity here, asking for donations. Um, you know, many schools have grown in things like broken wheelbarrows with a few hold, holes drilled in them, old tires um, that you can fill with, with, uh, with soil. Um, we have a nice resource on making a simple bed with cardboard where you just lay cardboard directly on grass or soil. And then if you have any bits of scrap wood, just putting them around the edge, you know, you don't have to nail them in and, and putting soil within that. Um, so there, there's lots of options there um, to create spaces. It will all be based on, you know, what, what space you have and maybe you already have some beds or if you're really lucky, you might have a greenhouse or something, um, which is obviously brilliant, but don't feel you have to go down that road. Um, you can also look at planting uh, fruit bushes um, or fruit trees or um, hazelnut trees as well for a more kind of permanent food supply. Um, and as well as this, maybe you might want to create other spaces for hot wildlife, like bird boxes, ponds, leaf piles, um, or leaving areas unmanaged. And these are all great for biodiversity, um, but they're also um, going to be beneficial for your growing space. So by um, attracting birds, for example, um, they might help you by feeding on, you know, slugs or snails that might be eating your crops. Um, if you create a, a leaf mold area, that will eventually turn to compost that you can use for planting. Um, mini ponds might attract frogs. Again, a good form of slug control. Uh, unmanaged spaces will attract pollinators and maybe they will pollinate your, your strawberries for you. Um, so again, it's good for, for showing students those links between uh, food and biodiversity. Um, so um, we have a, a bit of a, a calendar here for you. Um, not that we want to be really prescriptive, but you, you might find that this theme is more prescriptive than some of the other ones. Um, and the main reason for this is that um, there's, a, you know, obviously the, the food growing calendar um, is is linked to, to the weather and the time of year and it, it probably isn't the most suitable for the school calendar so we do try and advise you to to do things at certain times just to accommodate that um, so the general overview of the theme would be this here it's very simplified but um, in year one we'd be advising you to use autumn and winter as your your introduction to the theme setting up your committee doing your environmental review um, and getting ready then for spring and summer where you would be hopefully growing your crops and harvesting them. So this is the real um, final element we want schools to, to get involved in. We did find in the pilot that a lot of schools grew food crops but there wasn't a big focus on harvesting and using the crops that they grew. A lot of times they might go home with one or a couple of students um, and th there's not really that that link and closing the loop and um, so we'll talk more about harvesting in, in a few minutes um, and then the second year we recommend that the 
autumn winter in year two is used to study a global topic or the global impact of our diet. So we have um, a range of possible topics for you to look at. It doesn't have to be at this time of the year, but um, we're just recommending it because you'll be less busy with things like uh, growing and, and harvesting than you will be in at other times. Um, and then again, repeating the, the growing crops and harvesting in spring and summer. So these are the crops that we recommend that you grow, um, but it's not, um, you don't have to grow um, all or even any of these. We just recommend them because A, they best fit with the, the that school calendar in terms of they might be ready by May or June. Um, and also many of them will grow in, in smaller spaces. Um, so for each of these, we have got um, a crop card that has guidelines on when and how to plant them. You know how far the seeds need to be separated do they need to be started off inside or outside etc and um, so yeah we, we recommend that you're you're planting in spring and summer if you have a, a greenhouse that will extend the times that you can plant them in um and we we have found that some schools have left things like uh potatoes and carrots in the ground during the summer months and come back and harvest it in september um, so that's an option as well particularly if our summer was like last one and there was you know a lot of rain you know you don't have to worry about the fact that they're they're not being watered um but yeah we, we kind of recommend that it's this window that you you're focusing on planting in um it's, it's possibly the, the more convenient um, and this year um hopefully will be a good one for planting because um easter is so early so a lot of times schools will wait until after the Easter holidays to plant out. Um, and if that's later in the year, it makes your window a bit tighter, but it's nice and early this year. So you can be planting out in early April, which is great. Um, so yeah, like I said, feel free to, to mess around with this list. You can add in extra crops or, or different ones altogether. Um, and then in terms of harvesting, um, like I said, we, we really want schools to um, work with their students to, to harvest what they've grown um, and to prepare them and, and eat them in school. Um, again, obviously, every school will be different in terms of um, whether or not they have um, cooking equipment. Um, if you're you know, in a secondary school, you might have a home ec room, but most primary schools won't have that. So we've prepared um, lots of harvest recipes. Uh, many of which don't require any kind of, of cooking or heat source. Um, but uh, what we would advise maybe is that, you know, when it comes to June and, and most of the crops are ready to harvest, that maybe there could be a call out for a few chopping boards and big bowls and cutlery could be sent in from um, students or teachers and, and kept on site for a couple of weeks so that different classes can get involved. Um, so trying to, yeah, have some kind of, of harvest and um you know event around um cooking and eating them um is a really nice way to, to finish off the year. So here's a few images of schools um growing and harvesting. So you can see they all have different um types of foods or growing spaces. Some schools have bigger um you know beds and other schools were relying on on planting boxes and, and pots the skills using an old wheelbarrow. Um, and then here's some sample cooking actions. So, you know, we have in our in our suggested recipes, we have a range of things from simple salads to more complicated recipes. If you're lucky enough to have a hall burning oven like potatoes, bravas and pizzas and things. Um, and again, you can obviously come up with your own recipes. And um, this school here in the middle, they had a cool like a multicultural day where students brought in um, different um, recipes or ingredients from um, countries around the world that maybe they had some kind of connection with um, and everybody got to try different types of foods. Um, another school had like a, a, a picnic with um, foods that either they had cooked themselves or had been bought locally. So like a low carbon picnic, which is a nice one. Um, and then this is the, um, these are the global topics I mentioned earlier. And um, so a key aspect of the, the theme isn't just um, the, the kind of local actions of growing and cooking, but it's also looking at the global impacts of our diets. 
Um, so we have eight different options that you can you can look into. We say, you know, you have to pick one, but if you want to pick more than one, you can. So sometimes you might have different classes interested in, in different topics, and that's obviously fine. Um, many of these are really interlinked. So um, you'll find that there's a lot of connections between, uh, for example, our diets, our rainforests, and our diet, our climate. Um, there's a lot of links between pollinators and pesticides. So um, they do overlap. Um, and to help you with these, we have a good few resources on that. We have a presentation um, to help you pick what's most suitable. It goes into details of what you can do in each one. Um, and then we have got um, a resource called Global Topic Cards that has tons of information and links to other resources on each topic to hopefully get you going. Um, and this, over the next month, well, we had our, our, our first webinar on food waste there this week. I'm losing track of time. It's just there on Monday. Um, but we're, we hope to have a series of other webinars um, in November on some of the other topics um, that you, you can hopefully attend and get some ideas. Uh, so here's a few examples of projects on the global topics. You can kind of think about, you know, what kind of, uh, what are you more interested in doing? So the, the pollinators project, for example, there's a lot of opportunities for practical work there. You know, you can look to improve your grounds to attract pollinators. Uh, whereas the food miles project, um, this here in the middle, um, you might be more interested in doing like a campaign on, um, you know, reducing the amount of food eaten by people that has come from far away, learning about um, where our foods come from, um, etc. So um, there's loads of different options there. And here's some resources we have to help you. So um, this is a nice one at the beginning, food choices and labels. It's a good introduction. Um, it covers things like um, food waste, food packaging, food miles. So it's kind of about uh, taking a closer look at the foods we eat and, and learning a bit more about them. So that's a, a workshop you can do. And then we have workshops on the soil and seeds, which are nice ones to do before you start planting. You can learn more about your soil and have students understand a bit more how um, seeds are produced and how they grow. And then the crop cards, those have the guidelines for planting each of the recommended crops. Um, we have our harvest recipes book up there. Um, and we also have um, a YouTube playlist that has um, quite a lot of cooking skills, um, demonstrations, and also a series of recipes. So over the last couple of years, we've had uh, lots of workshops with professional chefs where they've recorded um, how to carry out different recipes and um, so you can follow along with those um, or get some ideas anyway on that um, YouTube page and then there's the global topic sheets there at the bottom that has information on the, the global topics. Um, so this is what the action plan should look like. Um, it should set out the action you wish to, to complete, who's going to do it and when you want to do it. So this is in our handbook um, and you can take as many ideas from it as you like and then come up with any of your own. Uh, it's a good way of splitting up the kind of tasks. So um, maybe one class in the school could complete the habitat map, whereas maybe the awareness survey is going to be done by the committee. OK, then step four. So step four um, should be done when you are on your second year of the theme. Um, and it, you're basically looking back and seeing, um, have you improved your levels of awareness? Um, and have you made any practical progress? So there's two, again, essential steps here. They're the exact same ones as in the environmental review. You're just repeating it a year later. So you repeat the awareness survey um, and you either create a new um, food habitat map or you add in any changes to your original one. So it's the same survey in year two. And then the, the map, this is an example of a map done by the school last year. You can see they were marking it in yellow and um, any changes that were made um, and using a key to do that. So, you know, you can mark in what you grew where, if you let the grass grow longer, if you put in any birdhouses, et cetera. Um, step five then is linking the work 
from this theme with the existing curriculum. Uh, and this um, this is taken from the handbook as well. These are a lot of examples and that again, you, you can pick and choose from. Um, so there's tons of ways that this theme links with um, other subjects on the curriculum. Um, obviously, for example, maths has a lot of links with the creating the awareness surveys, um, you know, maybe making a, a chart or a graph with the results, looking at percentages, um, lots of links with SCSE, obviously, in science. Um, with history, depends on what global topic you choose, you, you might focus more on, on these different elements. Step six then is informing and involving. So this step is all about making sure that everyone is connected to the theme, they know what's happening, um, and they have a chance to get involved. So, um, you know, hopefully you'll be adding things like the results of the awareness survey to your notice board um, or your food habitat map. Um, your action plan, and um, the different um, crops people are growing, etc. Um, but you can also look to, you know, maybe some of the students will be interested in writing a piece for your school newsletter, um, or if you have one, or if you have a parish newsletter or a local newspaper, um, they could write in that. Um, it could just be telling people what you're doing, or maybe giving them tips for what they can grow at home, or um, you know, if you're learning about food miles, you could share that um, with your community. Um, the action day. So you, you're probably aware from other themes that and we generally ask each school to have a day of action um, on their theme at some stage during the two years. Um, but because this theme, um, your day of action might be based around harvesting the food, um, it can be hard to, to coordinate that all over one day. So you might have one class who grew strawberries and lettuce and they might be ready to harvest on, you know, the week before someone else is harvesting their spring onions and radishes or whatever it is. So um, there's not a, there's not as much focus on making sure you have one day, um, we, but we do want to encourage you to, to celebrate with the harvesting food in some way. Um, step seven, then the final step is to create a green code. Um, which sets out your school's attitude or commitments to um, the theme. And it can be in any format you like, really. It can be a slogan, which is the most common format, probably. But it could also be a song or a code of conduct um, it, and, and so on. And again, it's a good way to get people involved. Maybe you could have a school competition to come up with this. And then um, the actual nitty gritty um of applying so to apply for this uh, green flag for this theme um you must have been working on it for at least two years um, and then there's two steps to carry out one is to submit an application form so we have an online system um that you can do that on and then um the second is to have a renewal visit let's talk a bit about both of those so the application form um which has to be in by March 15th. Um, I'd really advise everyone to look at the application form, you know, early and often if you can, even if you're in your first year on the theme, um, I'd check it out and just see, you know, what exactly do you need to, to document? Um, and you can save it as you go. So if you do your awareness survey before the, the midterm break, you can add in the, the results of that to your form now and just save it. And, and that's, kind of done and taken care of um you don't need to to worry about um keeping hold of them until um the following year um so that that's one element it basically asks you about all of the seven steps and um, that i've just talked about there and um, you can add pictures to it um so you can take a picture of your food habitat map for example and upload that um and then the second element of the renewal process is a visit um, and you must have your visit before you submit the form. Um, so you can organize a visit to take place at any stage during your second year. You don't have to wait until like the week before you're putting in your form to have it. Um, and I, as I said, that will probably be with your EAO. So um, you can contact them and arrange a, a suitable date. Um, and, you know, this is hopefully a really nice visit. You know, it's not like a school inspection. Um, they'll come in and meet 
the coordinator, they'll meet the committee, um, and they can kind of, you can kind of chat through the work you've done on the theme, how you completed the seven steps, and um, maybe give them a, a tour, show them the your notice board, show them where you grew your food, um, and they'll give you um, any feedback if necessary. So if they think, oh, maybe you should um, try and undo X or Y before you submit your form, you know, they'll tell you that they won't, they won't leave you in the dark. Um, so once you've submitted your form, we'll assess it. Um, and hopefully if you're successful, then we will invite you to our award ceremonies um, in May. So we've gone back to having our award ceremonies in person as of last year, um, which is great. And that will hopefully continue this year. So nearly finished now, guys. So just a few upcoming events and dates for your diary. So World Food Day, um, we've just had that. That was on Monday. Um, we had a webinar on, on food waste. Uh, so if you missed that, you can watch it back um, by clicking that link. Um, and a, a nice kind of um, interesting um, mobile exhibit is happening at the moment called the Biobus. So it's touring the country this, um, this month and next month. And um, it's open to anybody to attend, but they are particularly encouraging green schools to visit it. It's probably most suitable for secondary schools, possibly six class students. Um, but if you'd like to take your class there, you can book in a slot. You can click that link. It will bring you to a page about it. And there's um, a form you can fill out. I also send um, an email possibly with um, uh, the contact details for um, somebody involved in that. So they, they're happy to take bookings from, um, from school groups. Um, also coming up, we have got um, our, we're going to have a, a biodiversity challenge every season that you can get involved in. So the autumn challenge is to find and identify as many seeds as possible. So this cannot be, you know, if you have a packet of lettuce seeds, that doesn't count. It has to be seeds you find in the wild. Um, so yeah, maybe you could have a seed jar students can add to or a little nature table. Um, and the idea is to try and identify as many different types as possible. You can send in what you find um, by email if you like to this address. We will have a prize for the school that identifies the most different types of seeds. Um, and then um, I would advise you to have a look at the website. There's a lot of a uh, lot of resources there, a lot of lesson plans. Um, at, at, on the last page of this presentation, I have a link to our um, food and biodiversity theme page because it can be hard I know to find resources under the resources tab so we've put the most important ones in, in one place for you make it a bit simpler um, we also have a, some case studies including we have a new video case study with a school um, who were awarded their their flag for this team last year it can be a nice thing to show your committee maybe um, uh, yeah, this is exciting. Coming up in November, we have a Green Skills Week for secondary school students. We'll have a webinar every day at 11, um, just on different uh, things like how to have, run a meeting, how to have, run a communications campaign, etc. Um, so if any um, secondary school teachers would like to register their students to participate, they can click on that blue link there at the bottom. Um, and also, if anyone is interested in being becoming a climate ambassador for your community um, and learning how to, um, you know, go about organizing climate action events, you can apply to become a climate ambassador here. It's open to all adults and also secondary school students, if there's anyone in your school you'd like to share that with. Um, and also for secondary schools, we there's a new program this year called Climate Smart that has got seven free um, online workshops that you can um, take part in and you can register at climatesmart.ie. And another free set of workshops available is um, something that Antashka helps facilitate for SEAI. So these are sustainable energy workshops. You can learn about um, how to reduce your energy um, and also um, the importance of sustainable um, energy. So they have them for all different levels, junior, primary, senior, primary, and um, different secondary school groups, and also for teachers. So you can book um, a session there by clicking that link. 
And then lastly, if you would like to sign up for the Green Schools newsletter, you can scan that QR code there. Um, it's just a nice way to get all your Green Schools news in one place. Um, I will obviously be in touch with you throughout the year with upcoming events and news. But if you want um, to hear about what's going on on other themes, there's often other events open to all green schools. You can um, do that by um, signing up through that QR code. Okay, so I know that was a lot of information to, to throw out in a short space of time, but hopefully it's given you a good overview of the theme. And um, my main take home message for you really is do get in touch if you have any questions. Um, and I'm happy to, to organize a phone call or a Zoom with you um, and chat about anything you're not sure about. Um, and then our final page here has got the, the links to many of the things that I mentioned throughout. And um, so we'll be sharing that with you um, at the end here. Um, and I'm going to um, pause our recording here. So if anyone does have any questions, um, 